just have a question. Um, in terms of, like, I've just had a few, like, circumstances lately where I've been there with Yeah, I think that when you start to feel that intense energy, it's good that I would always kind of go inward a bit with it and and go um, point point my question inward into my own consciousness and go, what's going on here? Like if I was feeling intense energy and I could feel a defensiveness arising, I would say, hmm, interesting. I would notice the the awkwardness, the defensiveness coming up, and then I would say, hmm. What am I defending? I would just kind of take it inward. And then every time I would do that, I would notice, it would be very helpful because I would notice I had some kind of a, an image of myself that I felt was being threatened or weakened by this other person. You know, whether it was an image of being male or if it's an image of being an American or being white or, you know, any of those images, overlays, almost like the when we were younger, we used to learn from teachers that had those overhead projectors, and then they would do their teaching. They would start overlaying images on top, yeah. and then it would start filling up the screen. And my awareness of spirit was, spirit was saying, you have to just lift these overlays off, because every time you get defensive or you feel awkward, there's still some kind of self-concept or image that you're still holding on to. You know, let's say it's something like with being a man or a woman. You know, we're, you know, we've been in crowds and places, uh, maybe not so much here at Kalani, but different places where people will make these broad, sweeping generalizations and stereotypes. Like, all men are like this, or all women are like this. And if, if someone notices a defensive reaction coming up when those stereotypes come out, it's just still an identification with being male or female. Or um, there could be sweeping generalizations about, about a particular religion or culture or um, it could be anything. It could, could having to do with yoga or with A Course in Miracles or, or with a particular geographic location. Uh, anytime we feel a little bit awkward or defensive, it's, I've always found it's a huge inroads into releasing this concept that I'm holding on to myself. So I'm taking it too seriously. Then I can start to relax and say, I don't need to try to act spiritual here. Because that's like putting on a spiritual mask. Like I'm supposed to be loving, I'm supposed to be you know, peaceful, but my emotions are far from it. Then I would kind of like, I would either go away and kind of introspect on it a little bit and, and meditate on it and say, hmm, show me spirit, what is it that I'm clinging to? Or sometimes you can do what people have done here is just, spill the beans and say, I'm feeling, people were just saying, I'm feeling, you know, lost and confused, or uh, Melody, you were saying the other day, you were saying you, you were having stuff coming up and you were saying you thought it could have to do with well, the movies that movie or with me. Well, I watched that movie and I felt all that um, frustration, I, I was feeling frustrated and I wasn't sure where this frustration was coming from and then I was questioning everything about you and for some miracles and looking for some some sort of crack, um, you know, some sort of thing I didn't like, and um, it wasn't about that. Yeah, it was just reflective, and then so so talking out loud um, allowed Sam to help me just go. I think that stuff came up for you in that movie, and then it, uh, then that was true. There was like a definitely was, you know, several things that kind of keyed into emotions. So my emotions were churning. And they were not pleasant, and it was. Um, and I think I was trying to distract myself by making it about the horse, not about the movie. Yeah. So my ego was trying to make it attack you or the movies or you know the, the text in general or you. But it's so beautiful. I work. 
or actually we were glad Helena said, oh, wasn't that great? Because actually, you know, we've had come from a lot of spiritual practices where it's like, you get an unloving thought, and it's like, okay, control the form, uh, smile, you know, like that old song, smile though your heart is breaking, <laughs> smile even though it's aching, you know, it's like, that's, that's not integrated <laughs> by any sense. Some of these old songs, it's like, whoa, that's yeah. disintegrated if you've ever heard it. But, but actually, we talk about being transparent and, and bringing it up and talk about it, and that, that can be a way, uh, there's nothing special about talking about it, but it is like if you can talk about it, and underneath you feel a sense of safety, and a sense safety. of trust that, that you will, it will be used in a helpful way, then that's, that can become like a way that, that works well with all relationships, you know, where you can say, okay, I really just want to talk about what I'm feeling, and I, I know that maybe I'm taking something personally, or maybe this is my ego talking, but it really diffuses things, because... It allowed me to helpful. see the difference between what I truly came into the Course with, and, 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 and what I feel, what I feel is true, and my, truth, my spirit, and then this reaction that I was having, and this, this you know, I didn't understand this battle that was going on, and putting it out there and just saying, I don't understand what's going on here, why am I doing that? And then just Sam, as, as, as he witnessed, witnessed a lot with me since we've been together, um, he just says, I think a lot came up in the movie for you. And that's what helped me discern then, okay, that's where the forgiveness came in. It's like, Forgive myself for the feelings that I was having, didn't forget the force and the attacks that I was having in the mind, you know, to let go of, just let go of all of that. But if I hadn't become aware of it, I would stay in this, in that very confused, frustrated state. So, um, processing it out loud. Yeah, it's beautiful. Even people who work with the course, they'll have, they'll be reading along and they'll sometimes they'll have all this sweet feelings of love and joy and happiness and sometimes it's just these ego reactions to things and it's the same kind of thing that happened with Jesus a couple thousand years ago that he was just really kind and loving and friendly and happy and peaceful and yet the ego was like perceived that he was attacking like we, when we look at the, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin you know they had this mindset like we have the way we are the gatekeepers, we are the ones that people need to come to, to go to God. And you're just telling people how to go to God directly, you know, it's like you're, you're working me out of a job here and we're going to have to kill you because of it. Uh, but that's just an ego reaction, even though he was just offering healing and blessing and, and he really wasn't talking about penance and punishment and all these kind of things that got added on. He was just offering a simple message that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it's, it's about being present. And even his prodigal son stories were very loving. But uh, uh, can I actually cool. go back to Veronica's question? Because yes. I think that you're. Um, I just want to ask a follow-up mm -hmm. question. Yeah. So she, so she has, uh, or let's talk, I'll talk about Veronica. I have a confrontation with someone. Conflict arises, right? Um, and so you go inward and and uh, and, and let's see what just that feeling of defensiveness are coming up. And you look for the image of what you are holding on to. What is feeling threatened to me? Right. Uh, I'll give you one. I'll give you one so that we have a few. If you that yeah. Well. yeah, that's okay. good. We can work through an example. Um, oof, I cry. Forgive me now, because I'm a crier. Um, <laughs> 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 um, in my past relationship, I was married to me.
things were put on me as, as if I was the problem. And really, it was just communication coming together. And he was in, he, in no judgment in this place that he was, um, he, did, he wasn't taught forms of communication. So when a conflict would arise um, between us, I wanted to clear the air. I wanted to be able to allow forgiveness and quickly. He was more the type to sleep on it and not discuss it the next day and not discuss it ever. The show just he was taught to put it up, you know, to sweep it under the rug. Okay. So you have one person who is aggressive and the other person is very passive. To, to the degree that you have, you know, complete tilt, and so that that amplified over the years to the point of being um, <coughs> feeling very alone in my relationship. Um, so we had a situation come up where um, I'm not feeling comfortable. Um, <coughs> where it was just there was just a disconnect one day, and I was asking Sam questions about his past and, and just an experience of, of living in a dojo. And the way that the stuff came up, he just said, you know, I felt right at the time. That's why I did it. And that was a complete answer for him. And I was trying to get to know more about it. Well, anyway, that really wasn't the topic, but the trigger was he just he got frustrated with me because I was asking more questions. Probably sounded more like a reporter delving into something versus you know, just it, whatever the com conversation shut down. And we're, so we had a whole lunch of this uncomfortable silence that threw me back into you know, all these feelings of being stuck in a relationship that was not very lonely. And um, I got angry. I got angry at him. I got really just um, yeah, just a uh, rolling boil you know, inside because I tried to draw him out and tried to, to ask him you know how he was doing and I get a one word response. And it just it just didn't seem uncomfortable, which was where I was at in my former marriage. So yeah, I was identifying everything back to my previous experience. And and the ego in me was attached to, I'm not being in a relationship like this ever again. You know, I left that relationship behind. So it was, yeah, I went to an extreme of you know, being really yelling at him one day in a park, mm -hmm. you know. And anyway, we've recovered since then. Um, I mean, we've talked through it and things like this, but so when Veronica talks about a conflict coming up, here's a conflict of uh, Sam Paul Music. It was pretty a pretty minor, simple thing, and um, Sam was going inward to the point of making a decision that we were going to drive back to Kalani. So we've already had an hour sitting at a lunch with Sam, with the side one, and then we were going to have an hour in the car back to Kalani without discussing it. And I was in this hell no or not um, place, <laughs> and that's where the yelling started. So. Um, from that point, if you, you can use that example yeah. either way from either perspective. <coughs> Sam, if there's anything you want to share about that situation from your point of view, it might help. But there's, oh, there's yeah, a that's a very, it's a good example because it's, it's getting it's such a basic thing that the deeper you go inward, when I, I mean let go of everything you believe <coughs> about everything and every thought, that that there are a lot of assumptions, I'll call them, beliefs and assumptions that we have about communication, including the most basic assumptions like, well, if you've got a relationship going here, it's a two-way street. Uh, you know, you have to have communication from both people on both sides, and so on and so forth and so forth. And, and we could say that from the human perspective, from the ego perspective, we'll call that the horizontal plane. <laughs> okay, it's like we're bringing the cross here since it's Easter weekend. There's the vertical, <laughs> the vertical plane is your mind, and the horizontal plane is 
very personal and very interpersonal. And we have learned all these things about interpersonal communications. Some of us have even taken workshops on interpersonal communications, the give and take, the way that it has to be. The deeper you go into spirituality, you start to realize that however it looks on the screen of the world, that basically you're only ever talking to yourself and ever listening just to yourself. In fact, there's a line in the Course where it says, uh, what, what I say to my brother, in this case, Sam, is what I most need to hear. Very interesting, you know. Talk about mirroring, you know, it's like that's really a mirroring going on. So we have to actually, when we get upset because somebody, we think, oh here we go, the silent treatment. Uh, this is an issue that, I, that we, we really have to talk through and then I get, boom, the silent treatment. That's not going to, that's a no-go in the ego's perspective. Back around 1995, I had a girlfriend who was into A Course in Miracles and Joel Goldsmith, a lot of really good stuff, and she just did not like to talk through things. Uh, period. She would journal, just like you're writing down notes. Now that's what she was constantly doing. She would have the same ego stuff coming up and working through the same issues and she felt like journaling was her preferred way. So I would kind of look over to see if she... <laughs> the journal was private. <laughs> but still, it took me a while to start to just realize that, oh, I'm getting irritated and annoyed and upset because why? Not because of her, not because of anything she was doing or not doing, it was because of my expectations. It's always, we always upset ourselves based on our expectations. And we have a lot of learned beliefs around communication that, that come up in seemingly interpersonal relationships where there seems to be expectations on how the partner has to respond, uh, and and they're really loaded, you know, it's like a loaded gun, you know, you walk in there and it's almost like, you will talk, you will talk about these things, we will talk this through, and then if you get the, the silence, then it's like, it's perceived as an attack. It's almost like, if you loved me enough, if you loved me, you would speak to me. I was, I was uh, recently I was over in Belgium, and this lady came to me and she said, uh, can I talk to you? She said, the Spirit has guided me uh, not to read anything. And do you think this is the ego talking to me or is this actually the Spirit guiding me not to read? And so I spent a little time with her in meditation and everything and I just got this beautiful feeling that here was a woman who was so intuitive so in touch with her thoughts and feelings, and so advanced, and she was so intuitive and telepathic that she popped through things so fast that she really didn't need words uh, to do it. She was highly evolved in this manner, and I could feel it from her, and I said, yeah, you really don't need the words. And she smiled and she said, no I don't. She said, I'm so happy, I go through life so happy, but I just don't read anything anything. And, I, and it's, I mean, I flow f through life beautifully. I'm very, the Spirit just guides me. I don't have to read signs. I don't have to read books and newspapers and this and this. I don't have to read the internet. And I said, no, that's, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. I said, you're doing very, very well with your pet. So she said, I got a friend. Could I bring him to your gathering? And, and I said, sure. So she, she comes and she brings this man and they, they've got a kind of a, an attraction going on, and a, a, a friendship going on, and they're contemplating getting involved in, a, in an intimate relationship. And the man receives all of his meaning. He's, he's kind of like, reminded me of one of these rabbis that works with the Torah, you know. Everything that he gets that's meaningful in his life has to come through words. <laughs> you know, he has to define everything. Every, she says a word, define that. Uh, you know, you know, it's one of these highly, almost kind of cerebral thing where he could not, he really wasn't in touch much with his feelings at all, but he was 
going through scriptures, like with a fine tooth comb, he was interpreting, translating scriptures. He would spend probably 12 or more, 15 hours a day, just over the scriptures or over words, uh, constantly. He, he, and I talked with him a bit, and he said, well, he said, I, I really don't have a lot of trust, but I do believe that I can gain meaning from the words. So that's why he was putting all this meaning on the words. He wouldn't even attempt to accept a feeling that he was having unless he could, it was well defined, unless it was well structured. So then I talked to him for a while and then they came together and they looked at me and they said, David, we want to be in relationship. And I said, oh, I said, what, what kind of relationship are you thinking of? Uh, I said, I said, you both could come together and bring your skills and abilities maybe to a project uh, or some, a task or something like this. And they were like, no, we want to be in an intimate relationship. And they said, now give us your honest assessment of this. And at that time I said, well, you, it's, that would be extremely difficult uh, for both of you. I said, you probably have guessed that from just the time that you spend together. Because she was actually to a place where she was like almost like 100% intuitive and had wanted nothing to do with words. And he was to a place where he filtered everything that he perceived through words. And they were already having all kinds of irritations and annoyances come up. And she was like looking at me going, am I doing something wrong? And I said, no, you need to stick with your, <laughs> your path is working very well for you. But what it is, I think if they had spent even more time together, he would have to learn how to trust more and how to not become so reliant on the words. And we're trained, when we learn about interpersonal communication, there's part of our training is, you know, make eye contact, be a good listener, speak, allow the other person to speak. You know, we have all the stuff that's by the book, you know, in all these workshops that's reinforced so many times. And then, that's part of your lesson now, is that you seem to have, have attracted a man into your life again, where it is, there is a connection there, and your heart is opening, and you do feel the love, and that's all good, good, good. And what's getting undone is the belief that communication involves words. Uh, we all know when we go into to prayer or meditation, we can get really great things, messages that can come to us, and we, sometimes we just intuit them or we feel them. We, it's almost like we know them. We don't need a voice in our mind, you know, defining and describing the whole thing. It just washes over us in the insights. So, part of it is the ego has made up this world and guess who invented the words? The ego. Jesus, this, Jesus defines words in The Course in Miracles as Symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. Oh, and to think how important <laughs> words are in our society, in our so-called interpersonal relationships. Symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. Whoa. It gives new meaning to be still and know that I am God. But the first word in the Bible was in the beginning was the word. Yeah. And, and Jesus... Uh, does define the word. I always wondered what the word with a capital W was. In, a, in the workbook, he said the word is, is the essence behind I am as God created me. That's, that's what the word means, I am as God created me. But it wasn't meaning like word in terms of form, it was meaning the essence. You know? And even the part about in the beginning was the word and the word was made flesh, Jesus says, Actually, that would be like translating one reality into another reality because the word or the essence of who we are is spirit. And spirit never does become flesh. That's like trying to take something that's eternal and abstract and, and shrinking it down into form. So in the end, Buddha never really came to this world. Jesus, the Christ, never came to this world, but the Buddha nature which is pure spirit, or the Christ nature, that Jesus and Buddha simply were symbols that the spirit was using. And that's why we have the teachings of Buddha and the teachings of Jesus, 
but they were like holograms. They were just symbols that were appearing in the dream to point towards the towards love. You know, it wasn't like Buddha really incarnated or Jesus incarnated. It was that's just another concept of somehow the souls can incarnate. So once you get into that, you start to realize, oh, and even my beliefs about reincarnation are part of the system that has to get washed. And it's true, you know, we end up being very humble as we go deeper into the stillness because we see that our concepts were just temporary steps along the way. So back to, again, Veronica's question, I think was in conflict, more of conflict resolution, how to show love. Mm -hmm. I think you were, what, what you were saying prior to, if you go in or you see what image you're, uh, you're attached to, and then what? Then that's where the context of, of what we're talking about comes in, because you can start to see that the peace of mind is more important than holding on to the image. Because uh, we want peace, we really want to have a lasting peace, and so, you know, if you you go in and you can get in touch with this concept and you can say, ah, oh, this is just a self-concept that I've been clinging to. And in this moment, ah, it feels like I'm more attached to the concept than I am uh, desiring the peace. And then, you know, we can choose again. You know, we can take a few deep breaths, relax, and start to come back to that place like, okay, uh, this is not really a confrontation but I've interpreted it as a confrontation. But I can loosen from and release that interpretation, and that's where the peace comes in. Um, so, using that example, our example, um, the more dumb moment, how does that relate to the peace of mind? It's easy to do when things are peaceful. Um, that particular situation, you know, and then there's a reluctance. Some emotion might be that she's going to be very helpful. And you know, there's that initial, you know, back and forth. And for me, I was, when she's asking me these questions, I'm, I'm, you know, I was giving you uh, the best, I could answer the best that I could at the time. She asked me, what is Zen? Uh, or something along those lines, or what my experience was, you know, as a, as a student in, in the dojo. Um, and I'm intuitive, I was like, it, it, while I was there, it felt right. Was called for, and those are very real answers for me, uh, and very true answers, and really authentic answers for me. But they weren't good enough for her, or you know, she wanted more. She wanted more. She wanted, she wanted more. you to tell me a story. Right. I didn't. I didn't. There was something. There was something deeper into it yeah. before, and you know, I, I didn't understand what was going on. It, you know, I mean, I'm giving. I know, I'm, you know, this is coming up, and I see what's coming up, and stuff is coming up in me, and like, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm giving love and giving love, but you know, just this mm -hmm. anger coming right at me. Um, Not immediately. <laughs> Not immediately. I was feeling the need to connect, and I asked you why I went to the dojo, and you said because it felt right, and I was like, okay, so tell me about. Somebody's, you know, has to beat up, you know, uh, 
yell into the ocean, you know, and whatever, or you know, any pillows as used to be a um, But when it's coming directly at me, I have uh, hit them. Yeah, this is this is really good though because it's we got at that aspect of expectations and and at that aspect of there was some fear underneath there and and the world will reflect the fear. Our mind is so powerful that that sometimes it comes out in in strange ways or ways that we don't want it to come out. You know, we maybe we want it to come out in other ways, but not with our partner. And yet it just comes like a, a volcano here on the island of erupting. Uh, but I think the underlying context for it too is, is when you get involved in a relationship, that there are ego expectations there in the sense of, of subtle assumptions and subtle expectations. It's kind of like, you know, the ego is saying, okay, uh, I've got some needs and I've got holes, I'm lacking in certain ways, and I'm coming together with a partner, and this is going to be mutually beneficial. Uh, I'll fill some of your needs, you'll fill some of my needs, and we'll help fill the hole up a little bit that way. That's codependent. Uh, that's totally codependent. Even if we try to dress it up and make it romantic or whatever, there's some major codependency going on there. And basically, the way the ego works is the ego feels like it's lacking, it's incomplete. And so it looks at a partner, a relationship partner, as a real potential to fill up some of that lack, that it thinks it deserves love. And it's looking to the partner to bring that love and fulfill that, to, to feel more fulfilled. So basically if we strip away all the romance, that the ego is sizing up relationship partners as potential God substitutes. Uh, you know, like you. Oh, chosen one. The <laughs> uh, laser beam has landed on you. And out of all the, you know, it depends if you're, if you're bisexual or heterosexual, heterosexual, out of all the billions, whether it's three billion, six billion, whatever, out of all the potential options, I have chosen you <laughs> as the one that will fulfill me and give me all of the love that God didn't give to me. Uh, which is like this major God substitute thing, and it's destined uh, to fail from the beginning. I mean, who, who is going to, what human being is going to be the God substitute? You know, it's really a setup from the beginning. And yet, that's not the way that it's painted. It's like, oh yeah, I met somebody, I'm falling in love with them, and I feel really good with them, and it looks like they could be a potential partner, and we're moving into the cabana, and this, and this, and this. And then, but inside, the more you start to really be drawn together, the mask starts to come down. Mm -hmm. That's where it gets scary. And that's when it gets scary. Not yeah. because of him, but because of what he loved. Would I be worthy of love if he sees the real me? There you go. There, there you is. go. There was an unworthiness. So I showed it to him. <laughs> what I thought about yeah. I agree. Yeah. I just let it go that day. Yeah. I was like, I'm pissed off. I am. You know? And that's not the real me, I realize. Yeah. But that's who at that time. I was afraid of yeah. within me. Yeah, so beautiful. I mean, you can start to see there's a there's a way of working through it all. There's been twice now we've heard um, sh uh, be loving towards Sam said it this one said be loving towards the person in front of you, and the um, and I feel like that's similar to shining the flashlight on the spider the love. Mm -hmm. What is that like? Or what does love look like? Because you've also heard some weird you can yeah, the say, uh, I can't describe to you what love is. The Course isn't teaching you how to love, it's teaching you about the blocks. To yeah, love. removing the blocks. Right. Yeah, that, the, the key teaching of A Course in Miracles is that you must bring the darkness to the light. You don't try to bring the light into the darkness. So shining a light down a well is kind of a graphic symbol of, of how, I was using it mainly to show how the ego is, a, is afraid of light, it will avoid light, it will like move, move around the well to avoid the light because it is dissolved away, it's like it's over uh, when, when there's light. It's not like there's a battle ever between darkness and light, you know, when there is light, there is no darkness. It's the light of wisdom or the light of truth. But the light, in Course in Miracles terms, is like the light of the 
of love or the Holy Spirit within your mind and you continuously keep bringing everything that you believe toward that light. Like, this world was made on dissociation where it's like, it's like saying, okay, I'm going to dissociate all this light in my mind, just compartmentalize it, push it down over there, 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 and then I'm going to make up a world that's completely unrelated to the light or to God or to anything. It's just this fantasy world. And I'm going to say, let there be both. Light and darkness. And that requires a psychological process called dissociation. When somebody's dissociated, it's like Jesus says, you're trying to maintain two thought systems, love and fear, that have no meeting point and you're dissociating and you're trying to maintain them both and this is a split mind. You know, we call it schizophrenia in, or psychosis, a break from reality. This is like schizophrenia. He's saying you're trying to maintain schizophrenia using dissociation. But he's saying bring them together. If you bring these two thought systems together, only one will remain. But if you bring the darkness to the light, you go the opposite direction, you bring them together, one will dissolve away and the only the love will remain. So that's why it's so important whenever you have a reaction in a relationship or with whatever's going on, to go inward, like I was saying, to really take a look at what is this showing me? What image, what belief, what concept do, am I holding on to that is an obstacle to the awareness of love's presence? The love is still there. The light hasn't gone anywhere. But as long as I've got this concept that I'm holding up, that I'm identifying with, I'm shielding myself like an eclipse from the light. So for me, I mean, I went through all kinds of things with, with jobs and relationships and living situations where I would be tempted to blame some kind of circumstance uh, in the world. Like, I go back to that relationship I had with this woman back in the mid-1990s, and. She was studying the Course, and she was in an infinite way, and I thought, oh, this is great, this is fantastic, a relationship where somebody's deep into the Course, I thought, this is great. But when she would go into her mind, she would have this terror, and the way that she dealt with this terror in her mind was she would chain smoke, just chain smoke, just like one cigarette after the other, after the other. So I remember being up there and living this uh, room with her, and it would be Detroit, Michigan, it would be sub-zero temperatures outside, and you know, we had to keep all the windows all sealed up just to, to keep the warmth in and everything, and then she would start going through her terror, and then all of a sudden, the chain smoke started. So I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and I would like, I would go over to the, to the window and just crack, <laughs> just <laughs> like that as well. Breathe, breathe, <laughs> you know, it's like, and then I would just go, okay, this is my issue, <laughs> this is not her issue, you know, even in the face of thick smoke, I would, I would say, you know, whatever irritations and annoyances that I'm having, or whatever is causing me to hang, stay in this room, <laughs> or whatever was going on, I would have to bring it back to, okay, there's something that I, that I have to learn here, I, I can't just, project it out and say that it's her distorted way of dealing with her fear of love, I had to bring it back to what's the lesson in it for me. And, and that's the thing that's so great about this path is that you, you do have to be practical. Uh, we were talking about that earlier, you know, if you found yourself, uh, that was one of the questions that was asked me at the lunch table was, what if you find that somebody in a relationship is hurting you, or you're in an abusive relationship. And I was saying, well, on the one hand, the ego itself is the belief in abuse, is the belief in victimization. And so, when you're confronted with somebody and you believe somebody's hurting you, that's just another opportunity to pluck the offense, so to speak, from your own consciousness, the belief in abuse. Uh, there's a part in A Course in Miracles where Jesus says, Beware of the temptation to perceive yourself unfairly treated. Wow. Imagine applying that on a, on a daily basis. 
beware of the temptation to perceive yourself unfairly treated. It's always a thought, it's always the fear and the thought in the mind that's just being acted out in the world, because that's what the world does, it just acts out our beliefs. So that takes a lot of mind training to apply on a consistent basis. And I told the woman at lunch, I said, yeah, if you felt like you were with a partner and he was hurting you and hurting you, you know, you always have the option, you know, you can just move and leave. And she said, yeah. I said, that's, but, but still, if you find that same pattern repeats over and over in other relationships, you know, sooner or later, and hopefully sooner for all of us, we start to go deeper into this ego belief in victimization, this idea that somebody can hurt us, you know, because yeah. when we believe in the ego, we're literally doing it to ourselves, and we can stop doing it to ourselves as we release these self-concepts and release the ego. Well, in this example, I fulfilled my own fear that day. I mean, I, I knew I was all, I was having fears, but I didn't admit them to Sam when we were on our way in the ego. You know, so, fear of a relationship. So I'm sure that was coming out maybe in a sharper tone with, when I was asking him questions. Um, and he was feeling put on the spot and not, you know, you can have your own feelings. But, yeah, I, I, I brought the fear into the day. And instead of telling him how I was feeling, I covered it up with a good face. And I'm good at that. And that mask is, is convincing. Whereas if I had been um, just shared my fears, um, the day would have, he would have received it differently and the day would have been uh, different. But I learned a lot from that day. I did learn yeah. a lot. And that's beautiful. I'm, I think of a lot of the clips, we still have um, some time to go through these great clips. Yes. Yeah, you want to sing that one? Yeah, we have a song here that's coming to mind for Helena, and then we really have a lot of clips that we can view that really relate to this, this people-pleasing mechanism, you know, where you, we put on a face you know, for the, for the good of the relationship, you know, to not scare anybody away and, you know, so they won't really see what's underneath. It's, it's like a, a training, you know, to smooth things over, to keep the ship sailing and not sink the ship so fast. And we have a lot of really good clips about slowly working away from this people-pleasing mechanism um, and putting on a face to really learning how to really just speak uh, what we're feeling and, and learn to do it in a constructive way, you know, not in a kind of a, a directing, attacking or vicious way. When we, when we allow our emotions to build up to such anger, it just means we've been really thick into people pleasing, you know. We've, just like children sometimes, will work themselves into an angry fit and then they need time out, you know, to cool down a bit. It works with adults too, you know, where you, where you just go through this mechanism and you, you keep jumping past these decision points where you could talk about it in a kind of constructive way. And you say, nah, you push it down, you push it down, and then at some point the volcano erupts and then it seems like a blow up. But it's more learning to trust and just say, no, I can talk about these things as my trust grows stronger and stronger. In, in a very constructive way, and we have a lot of great uh, movie clips too that show how helpful it is to undo that mechanism, uh, how beneficial it is. Yeah, that you might say that that the ego is the guilt. So it's important to expose, you know, flush up this repressed, denied guilt, and then to let it go. And so as we're able to do this, we're able to disidentify from the ego. And so guilt and the ego are synonymous. And the I 
that's not guilty is our Christ self, our the Buddha self, our our spiritual self is pure innocence, pure happiness and love and joy it has nothing to do with guilt. So it's almost like a like an affirmation of of, of saying I am not guilty. As long as you still believe in the ego, there there still is some pockets of that ontological or deeper guilt in the mind. Not the guilt of, you know, going against your word or not paying some money back to somebody or, you know, even infidelity and the things on the world, on the surface of things, that seem to be the source of the guilt. Like infidelity, for example, seems to be a source of guilt. But that's a projection of guilt. It's a projection of this deeper guilt in the mind of separating from God, and it's just projected out. And you might say that all of time is like a trick. So the ego knows that it needs the guilt to exist, because that's what it is. But it wants to minimize the guilt. So one of its tricks was linear time. It just spaces the guilt out over millennium to dilute it. So you just get a diluted form of, of guilt. It would be like the ego saying, okay, here's here's a cup of poison. Now you have to drink this. <laughs> but you can have you can drink it any way you want, any form you want. And so you go, okay, all right, I'm going to just mix it with some water before I drink it. Straight. I'm going to mix it with the ocean. <laughs> Throw the cup in the ocean. <laughs> then say, okay, give me the cup back. Let it splash around a little bit with the waves and then I'll drink this because it's a diluted form of poison. But, but in the end what Jesus is teaching us is like, you can't know your innocence even if you take a diluted form of poison. You have to be poison free, you know, you have to be ego free to know your divine spirit, your love and your light. And that's why there really is no partial forgiveness. But that's why people who work with the Course, you know, really go at it to go for the actual experience of that innocence. Not just the words, you know, we've heard a lot of nice words and many different poets and singers and for centuries mystics and saints have been speaking beautiful words that resonate with our heart, but the actual experience of this egoless state of mind, you know, the state of divinity is really the goal. That's the goal of spirituality. And so that's what that line means. Just an affirmation, I am not guilty. Had a song? Yes. Well, that whole song's about crucifixion, which for conviction, or convicting yourself. Right? Yes. So, and releasing. to not be guilty, you have to be guilty of, of needing to be convicted of crucifixion. Yeah. No, I mean, the more you go into this experience, you, you feel the connectedness that they talk about in quantum physics, how everything's connected. And this, this sense of, of separation that comes from being invested in the ego, it just, you lose it. You literally lose that. That's the only thing you really let go of or release, is this sense of separation. And so, you do become consistently joyful and happy and peaceful in this connection, feeling connected to source. And in my case, you know, I still see the world, but it's just like I'm not judging it. I'm not trying to interpret it or make something meaningful out of it. It's more just a real soft sense of looking upon it very gently, <coughs> without any judgment. Okay, we'll have a song and then we'll have some really great movie clips coming up. <laughs> to go back into the movie clip adventure. Thank you. 
I can stop your image in time Try to change you or make you mine When I give you to love Choice and I can choose again to see only. 